Just wanted to say, super excited um, that Janet is here with us this evening. Um, Janet's a longtime Burlington resident. Uh, she's the author of several books on social ecology, including Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, um, published last year. Um, her books also include um, The Murray Bookchin Reader, 1997, The Politics of Social Ecology, Libertarian Municipalism, um, and those books date from her 19-year collaboration with Murray Bookchin. Um, and she's recently translated into German from English, into from German into English, several books on the Kurdish connection, including Democratic Autonomy in North Kurdistan uh, and Revolution in Rojava, um, which is forthcoming. Forthcoming from Pluto Press later this year. Yeah, so we're really excited for that. I also wanted to thank um, uh, Black Rose, Rosa Negra. Um, Patrick is on his way um, for as one of the co-sponsors also uh, toward freedom. Uh, Robin was here earlier and Ben um, couldn't make it. It's a progressive journalism um, outlet. And then also uh, the Fannie Lou Hamer branch of Left Roots, which is Jonathan all the way over in the corner if you want to learn more about that. Um, so with that, um, thanks so much uh, and welcome. Thanks so much. Yeah, maybe we can start with a hand. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on this bitter cold night. I really appreciate it. Um, and I really appreciate your interest in coming here as people are, are marching by the tens of thousands in North Kurdistan tonight to protest the military operation, indeed, the war that is being waged against the Kurdish people now by the Turkish state. So I really appreciate that, and I'm really pleased to be doing this as as a token, if nothing else, of solidarity with, with those very brave people. Um, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about Rojava, but before I do that, I need to give you some of the prehistory of Rojava, which happens to involve um, Vermont. There's a Vermont connection um, involving this man who you see up here, Murray, Murray Bookchin. Those of you who have been around here for a while might even recognize him. Believe it or not, there is a connection between him and Rojava, and that's what I. So I'm going to talk about that prehistory for a while and then we'll go there. So bear with me. Um, his influence was ideological, so I need to talk about ideas for a while, um, and I hope you'll, hope you'll bear with me. Okay, so Bookchin was born in 1921 in the Bronx. Um, didn't move up here till the 70s, or 80s, 70s and 80s, actually 70s. Um, and uh, he was a, a radical, uh, born as a, um, into, he was in the Young Communist Movement in New York. Um, in the 30s and 40s, he gave up Marxism-Leninism at the end of the Second World War because he saw that the proletariat was not revolutionary. They were militant, they were strident, but they were not revolutionary. And he thought capitalism, however, is a very destructive system. There has to be a way to end it. And unlike many people of his generation who gave up and moved to the right, um, um, and went into the system at the end of the war. He said, no, we are going to, I need, we need to rethink the revolutionary project. We need to rethink socialism. So that's what he's, he and his comrades set out to do at the end of World War II. And one thing he noticed at the end of World War II was that the country had become very, very centralized. So it had been, how do you, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show me how to, what do I press to make it go forward? Just, what did I press? Oh, the, just the arrow keys. I'm sorry. Okay. So I don't mean to insult your intelligence by showing you this. But this is a, just an example of that the country had become politically centralized. The cities had become, were becoming huge. They were becoming anonymous places where um, people, people went to work in a routine, soul-crushing jobs. Um, uh, were moved around in mass transportation. Um, the cities were, were polluting. Um, the, the New York where he lived was a center of finance, which is becoming very centralized. Um, I industry was becoming very centralized. Large scale factories and installations. Energy, this is, a, this is a power plant. Energy was becoming very, very centralized fossil fuels. Um, he, was, he was concerned about this gigantic scale because he had grown up in a little neighborhood in the Bronx where everything was human scale. And he really loved that, that ethnic, that Jewish ethnic neighborhood where people, you knew, knew people face to face and you could work on politics face to face. 
and you weren't part of this, this overwhelming mass. So he was troubled by this whole phenomenon of centralization, of political, of economic, of industrial centralization. And he was troubled by the fact that it was, of course, polluting. This was one of the most obvious facts that came up after the war, was that industry was polluting. Cities were being, these huge cities were being choked by traffic, by automobiles, especially New York after Robert Moses built a ton of highways. Until this is what the American cityscape was beginning to look like. Parallel to that, what he thought of as an urban monoculture, where everybody's jobs were the same, everybody's lives were the same and anonymous, was an agricultural monoculture. That there were no more small farms, they were giving way to large industrial if you could call them farms, installations, agricultural installations, where instead of diverse crops as in the past, monocrops mono were being raised, and they were susceptible to, to, to pest infestations, and so it was necessary to use a huge dose of, of apply a huge dose of chemicals in order to make these, make these, um, uh, make this farming kind of agriculture work at all. Um, the, Crops were grown far away from the cities, far away from where they were consumed, so that meant you had to have preservatives to, so things, things could be shipped over distances. He was, one of the, he was writing about this in the 1950s, by the way. Um, um, and, and, uh, yeah, so, so, and the use of chemicals was lavish, and he began to realize, and this is where, this was the key to him, to this, to the, where the, the centralization of agriculture was a thing that sort of broke the camel's back for him, because he realized that that had to be the limits of capitalism. All these chemicals were threatening health, were threatening human health, because he saw that they were, there were studies coming out showing that they were carcinogenic. So it was necessary to decentralize society, and decentralize it in all those different ways that I talked about. For example, in terms of the city, instead of those giant megalopolises, he drew on a tradition called the garden city tradition, going back to the late, late um, 18, 19, to, to Ebenezer Howard, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, ways to integrate town and country so that, that, that cities would be livable and small scale. They could, be, they could be decentralized and food could be grown once again near where it would be consumed so you wouldn't have to have all those, all those preservatives and crops could go back to being diverse. There was this new concept of organic farming that was coming in, although he didn't use that word because that word wasn't being used yet in, his, in, in the 50s where, in his circles. But, um, but this, 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 um, this was a, an example of how Ebenezer Howard thought of, thought of making these kind of small-scale satellite cities where town and country could be integrated. Bookchin was very inspired by this, and also especially by the work of Lewis Mumford, um, who, was, um, who thought in terms of the city in a region, of, of integrating the city, a small cities into a regional, into the region. But he was most excited by the work of somebody I had never heard of until I met Murray called E.A. Gutkind, who was a German urban planner and an anarchist. And the interesting thing about Gutkind is that where, it's, it's where these cities were huge, he wanted to actually literally break them up. Not, not create little satellite cities around it, but actually break up, disperse the large cities, and integrate town and country that way. And Murray thought that was, was he was very inspired by that. This is another, these are images from Gutkind's book. Yes? Say the German guy's name. Erwin Anton Gutkind, like G-U-T. K-I-N-D. So, so this, was what, this is kind of what it might look like and this is from a, 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 what a garden city might look like. Um, and he, um, in the 1970s, by this time Murray was in Vermont and he had co-founded a school called the Institute for Social Ecology where they explored this kind of decentralization, especially the decentralization of energy so that where these um, huge fossil fuel and coal burning plants, he thought they were t integrally tied to the large scale of the city. And so it was necessary to, to look to, to renewable energy, which he thought were inherently small scale. He wouldn't have approved, been, have approved of these large arrays out in the desert of creating, creating you know, solar energy on a large scale. He thought that, that, they were, that the solar and wind energy would be integral to a small scale decentralized society. So it was here at the Institute that he, there were the, actually some of the first experiments in Vermont were done here. I think this is the first solar, solar, solar apparatus in the state of Vermont. I'm not sure if somebody told me that, but I have to verify it. Um, they experimented with wind. This is, by the way, this is down Goddard area um, in Plainfield. This is a solar greenhouse. Um, and, oh, uh, and they, he was, uh, 
It was interesting because they, 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 they did a lot of experiments with um, urban farming, with um, what's now called permaculture, with creating these kind of closed loop systems so that the sun could come into the greenhouse and, and, and warm the water and, it, and, and the, the vegetable waste would be used to feed fish. And, and this actually turned out, even though the experimentation was done in the countryside of Vermont, it turned out to be perfect for cities. So some of Murray's friends working, working down the Lower East Side of New York began doing those kinds of, applying those works in an urban context. Again, to all to, it's all toward that decentralizing the city kind of thinking. Um, this is La Plaza Cultural, which was created by, by Chadas, a group he worked with, a Puerto Rican group he worked with on the Lower East Side, still there today. Um, but I mean, now today, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, there's a lot of thinking that's been done about greening, greening cities and urban farmings. But that was, that, that Murray was um, an, a, a pioneer of this kind of thought, all right? So decentralizing cities. He also wanted to decentralize manufacturing. He thought that there was, um, it said the economy and technology didn't have to be centralized. It could be de decentralized into small scale since there was automation and miniaturization. He talked about the, what the role that computers could play in creating, in creating small scale uh, factories in these kind of in these small eco communities, he called them, where town and country were integrated, and that and they could be automated, so people wouldn't have to work so much, so you could be free of toil, and machines could make machines, and what would you do with all that spare time? You could become, you could become managers of your own community. You would have time to participate in self government, in democratic self government. So this is the opposite scale edge of what he was, that, that US Capitol building that I showed you at the beginning. This is what he wanted to decentralize that to, the town meeting. He was inspired by the Vermont town meeting, people meeting face to face and making decisions about their own lives. He, he was reading about the, the ancient Athenian polis back in the 50s, um, um, books about how the, the, the ancient Athens, well, it, was def, it was an all male assembly to be sure, and he didn't want that, of course women would be included. But people could make decisions even in wartime, even amidst wartime, fighting, fighting the Persians, fighting the Spartans. The people of Athens made decisions about their community life. And so he, he, when he came to Vermont, he fell in love with the town meeting. And so this would be the alternative. But a town meeting seems to have application only to a town, right? So he thought that if we're going to, he was an anti-statist, he was an anarchist. If we were going to get rid of the state, there had to be a way for people to govern themselves over broader areas. Just, just a, a, because there's a, there's a limit to how many people can get into a, an assembly meeting, a citizen's assembly meeting in a town. So the, the solution to that, it comes out of anarchist thinking, was the confederation. So that over a certain area, um, the citizens assemblies would send delegates to a confederal council to make decisions about broad scale things. And then there could be like even several levels, several tiers of, of confederal councils. But delegates would be mandated from below. Power would always have to flow from below. Otherwise, you're going to replicate the state all over again. So, um, and he's, the model that he had in front of him of what not to do was actually the Bolshevik Revolution, which he studied very closely. Those soldiers, those Soviets, were originally democratic institutions. And they existed at all different levels throughout Russia and culminating at the top. It was originally, they were originally built by the soldiers and sailors and the workers in Russia to be a democratic institution. But then once the Bolsheviks came to power, it was almost like flicking a switch in power. They could, these same institutions that were meant to have flat power flow from the bottom up became institutions of totalitarian rule. So very careful to avoid that. And we can talk a little bit later about different ways um, to keep power going from the bottom up, because that, I think, is one of the innovative things that's happening in Rojava now. They are writing, they are now writing the history of how to do that. So here in Vermont, of course, we don't have the confederations. So this is Murray, he's teaching at the Institute. He's, he talked, he tried to interest the new left in the 60s in these ideas, but they were more interested in international Marxist-Leninist revolution. They weren't fascinated by Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong and Che Guevara and Castro. They weren't interested in hearing about these kinds of eco communities. They wanted an um, international proletarian revolution. So they said, never mind, Bookchin. In, in the 1970s, he tried to influence, tried to interest radical environmentalists and anarchists 
in these ideas, and that was actually the period when, probably when he was the most popular, but Anarchists had, the Anarchists had trouble with this idea of um, democracy, of voting. Um, they, they, they didn't like institutions, and they were very suspicious of, you know, vote, you know, these town meetings, you vote majority rule, but majority rule is rule, right? So they were very suspicious of that. Um, in the 80s, he tried to, tried to interest the international anarchist movement in it, uh, but again, came up against, came up against that, that brick wall of suspicion of politics on the, that, that anarchists seemed to harbor. And um, the green movements were arising. Green politics rose in the 80s. Um, he was very, very uh, involved in the creation of green politics. In the 80s, in Europe, he was advocating non-traditional parties. He was advocating these, that green parties in Europe for advocate these kind of, this kind of um, decentralized citizens' assemblies in confederation, um, a, a program that he finally, in the 80s, gave the name libertarian municipalism to. But the Green parties weren't interested. They went on to become conventional parties. He talked and he talked and he talked. In the 90s, he tried to interest the anarchists again, but they finally said a decisive no. So basically, he died a disappointed man. Um, he said, well, I've tried for all these, all these decades. I did the best I could. I've talked indefatigably. I've given lectures. I've written books. At least the books are there. And maybe someday, Somebody somewhere will read those books and take an interest in these ideas. Meantime, I've done the best I can. And so he died in 2006. But before he died, in April of 2004, one day, into our inbox, we shared, a, we shared email, came a note from somebody representing this man. This is Abdullah Ujlan, the founder, co-founder of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, which was founded in 1978. Like Murray, he started out a Marxist. The PKK was a Marxist-Leninist organization originally, and its goal, it was created because the Kurdish people, the largest stateless ethnicity on the planet, were per, lived in, live in four different countries and are persecuted in all of them. In Turkey, where most of them live, um, where they have the largest concentration of Kurdish population, they had no, no cultural rights. They weren't permitted to identify publicly as Kurds. They couldn't speak their language publicly. They couldn't publish. Because in, the Tur in Turkey, the Turkish constitution, that in many ways was progressive, created by Ataturk, but in that Turkish constitution, it says everybody who lives in Turkey is a Turk, period. Now remember, this is the country where the Ottoman Empire used to be, right? The, that was, if you know anything about the Ottoman Empire, you know it was just, there was just a whole bunch of different ethnicities all living sort of cheek by jowl. And it was very, actually very, it, it was called an empire, but it was really very loose. Turkey was actually filled with all kinds of different ethnic groups, different religious people. So, so it was very, very weird for them to, for Ataturk to say, or for the Turkish constitution to say, only the only people who live in Turkey are Turks. And it just, it just definitely, definitely excluded the other ethnicities, including most painfully the Kurds, who were a proud people with a long history and, didn't, and, and immediately started rising up. Um, for gen this went on for like the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. They kept, they kept they, their, their resistance to this was brutally crushed at all times by the Turkish state. So finally, they, was, they, they, was, they had no choice but to form in 1978, since there was no recourse, the PKK, which is a guerrilla army, and to basically go to war against the Turkish state. And they went to war in 1984. And that war went, went on for, it's really still going on now, um, but it reached its peak, a peak in the 1990s um, when the Turkish state uh, yeah, raised, raised Kurdish villages. The Kurds had lived in many, many villages around the south at, southeast. The state came in and evacuated and burnt down thousands of them and drove the villagers into the cities like Diyarbakir, um, where they basically lived in poverty and slums. And the new generation of young people that are coming up now that are that are that you see resisting now, they're the children of the of the people who moved there in the 19, who, who were forced to move there in the nineteen nineties. They've only known the city life. So um, in any case, due to basically you know, geopolitics in the Middle East that I won't 
going to um, Arjalan, who had been living in Syria, outside Turkey, right, um, was told that he had to leave. Um, Turkey was going to invade Syria if, if Syria didn't get, expel him. So Syria did, and Assad did. That would be that would be not Bashar Assad, but his father Hafez Assad, expelled him. And there was an international manhunt in 1998, going into in February 1999. He was captured. He was put on trial in Istanbul um, and sentenced to death um, and imprisoned on, 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 on an island in the middle of the Sea of Marmara, which is just outside Istanbul. It was an island prison. Well, it had been, it had held prisoners in the past. Actually, um, if you're familiar with Midnight Express, that, that, that story, it was, um, yeah, part of it took place in, in Imrali Island. But, um, it was a new prison was built just for him, and he would be the only prisoner. And and he lived. He was condemned to solitary confinement and then to death. But a couple of years later, um, Turkey, the state, commuted his sentence to life imprisonment because um, Turkey was trying to get into the European Union, and the European Union said no capital punishment. Can't do capital. You can't. You can't execute people if you want to be in in uh, the European Union, so Turkey commuted it to life in prison, he's sentenced to life imprisonment, and he's still there now, still to this day. Um, still solitary, although he had, there have been phases where he had, where there were other prisoners that he could talk to, but as far as I know now, he, the only human beings he talks to are his guards. And he, he, and he was able to see his lawyers up until 2011, and one thing he asked his lawyers to do was bring him books. Because yeah, what would you do in prison? I, would, I don't know about you, but I would do a lot of reading, and he did a lot of writing, and he did a lot of thinking. He asked for books, and he asked his comrades out in the PKK to recommend, recommend books for him. And there were, I, there's a, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books by different authors of all, of all kinds were brought to him. Um, Bookchin had been translated into, Bookchin's most important books had been translated into Turkish in the mid-1990s. And someone suggested his book on this kind of dem democratic confederal system um, called The Rise of Urbanization. Uh, that was brought to him, and he, he liked, he was very interested in that, and he asked to bring, he asked for everything by Bookchin to be brought to him. Um, and became very, very interested in this whole program of face to face democracy in confederation. I can't say that. Reading Bookchin was the only thing that influenced him, and he had actually, he, Erdogan had actually been moving away from Marxism-Leninism since around 1990, the fall of the Soviet Union. So I, I don't want to make too many claims for for Bookchin's influence. However, it was quite real. Um, in in uh, April of 2000, April 4th, 2004, I sat down and opened my email, and there was a letter from some intermediaries for Mr. Erdogan. Um, they, they had been, uh, so it was Ochelon t told his lawyer, talked to his lawyers, the lawyers talked to the intermediaries, and the intermediaries wrote to us, to Murray, and then later to me, um, saying, saying uh, that he'd been reading Bookchin's work, and he was very interested, and he actually considered himself a good student of Murray, and he considered himself a social ecologist, that was the name he, that Murray used for his ideas, I consider myself a social ecologist, he wrote. And he said that he wanted to create the first polity on the planet based on Murray's ideas. And by this time, remember I told you Murray was very disappointed and he was also ill. He was two years from death. He was, he'd been, he'd had got his hopes up too many times. And so he was very appreciative. He was, um, he was a little surprised because he thought of Argelan as a Marxist-Leninist. Um, but apparently he was moving away from that. But he um, he 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 was he wrote back to him respectfully, saying, "I'm sure that the Kurdish people are in good hands, and the intermediary uh, under your leadership." And the intermediaries said, "Why don't you have a dialogue with Mr. Ojalan?" But Murray said he was just too sick and too tired. I wish that this had all happened just a few years earlier, where Bookchin would have been able to have that dialogue, but didn't. Um, so. But well, that didn't keep, that didn't keep, uh, it didn't deflect Mr. Ojalan, who went on to transform Bookchin's ideas for the middle, a Middle Eastern context. He, instead of calling it libertarian municipalism, as Murray did, he called it democratic confederalism or democratic autonomy. 
and he issued a, um, a declaration of democratic confederalism in 2005. In 2006, Murray died in July of 2006. And in that, that fall, someone forwarded to me a salute to Bookchin, a tribute to Bookchin, um, commemorating the death of the great social scientist of the 20th century who showed, who showed us the importance of giving up Marxism, Leninism, and that showed us that face-to-face -face democracy and confederal democracy are the, are the, is the next, the, next, the next revolutionary program, and showed us the importance of ecology and of decentralization and of opposing hierarchy. This is, this is actually the one huge difference I mean, there are many differences, but the most, the most pro pronounced difference between Ergelon's work and Murray's work is that Ergelon prioritized the domination of women. Bookchin had been opposed to all hierarchy. Ergelon singled out patriarchy. And he made, and I think this is also partly his, his own doing, but it was also the result of many struggles within the PKK. Because up, out there in the Kandil Mountains where they trained, where they were they, they were female guerrillas as well as male guerrillas. They were fighting and putting their lives on the line against that Turkish state just as much as the men were. And they demanded to be treated equally and they demanded to be taken just as seriously. So it was, there was a struggle, a struggle for the recognition of women inside the PKK that led to Mr. Ocalan prioritizing patriarchy as essential for, for being destroyed. Um, and, 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 so to, and to this day, as we'll see, um, the gender equality is a, is a crucial pillar of democratic confederalism. So, so this is Lurchelon getting, getting um, captured. And this is, this is, these are the places where Kurdish language is spoken, so there, where Kurdish people live in the Middle East. As you can see, there's maybe, uh, there's been no census, but maybe between 25 and 35 million Kurds, most of them are concentrated in Turkey. This is. Yeah, this is Iraq. This is now the Kurdish regional government. Um, it's a semi-autonomous zone in Iraq now. Um, this is Iran. We don't hear much about the Iranian Kurds because they have such a repressive system there. And this is Syria. This will be Rojava. So this just gives you an idea of, of where they live. Um, in 2011, I was invited to, to um, um, so a, Kur a, a young Kurdish man named uh, Erdan Eboga had, had, he knew about me, he'd heard about me, and he got this idea that I might be interested in the Kurdish movement and they might be interested in me. So he invited me to a conference in Diyarbakir in Ahmed. That's, it's about right here. It's the de facto capital of, of uh, North Kurdistan. Oh, terminology. North Kurdistan is their word for the Kurdish part, or for, for the Turkish part of where Kurds live. West Kurdistan is in Syria. Rojava means west, west Kurdistan. East Kurdistan is the Iranian part, and south Kurdistan is the Iraqi part. So they, they all have special words. So, so, this, so I went to, so, so Diyarbakir is the largest city in north Kurdistan, and that's where, that's where a lot of the fighting is going on now, tonight, today. Um, and I went, and you can see these beautiful ancient walls there. And this is, um, these are my first Kurds that I met. This is Erjan who invited me, and you can see he's there with a man in traditional Kurdish gear. And it was a conference called the Medi Mesopotamian Social Forum. Azadi, that means freedom, freedom will prevail. And um, I was just, I saw, I saw ecological activists. He calls himself a social ecologist. He's fighting a, fighting a huge dam being built on the Tigris River outside Diyarbakir that's gonna flood a 10,000 year old settlement um, he's been fighting, Erdogan has been fighting that for oh, some 12 years now. It's called Hassan Kif. This is all going to be flooded. All going to be flooded when, this when and if this dam is finished, this Ilusu Dam. He's been working very hard on that. Also at the conference, I met women. See, um, stop, stop feminine aside. I met, I met women lawyers there who talked about, who talked about, Honor killings that are endemic in the Middle East. How a woman, when a woman is, if a woman is sexually assaulted, it's not the man's fault; it's her fault, and she is considered to have brought shame on her family, and so she must die. It's called an honor killing. Either some, her male relatives kill her, or else she has to kill herself. This is a barbaric practice in the Middle East. 
um, you can see why the liberation of women became very important in Ocalan ideology. Um, so they, these are lawyers who are working on this problem of, of polygamy, which is also endemic to that area, of, <coughs> child, of childhood marriage, of domestic abuse, of, 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 of rape, um, this, this uh, incredibly oppressive culture. I saw these, these women there talking, and in the audience are these like 60-year-old men. They look like these old, old guard PKK fighters from back in the old days. And they're listening to these young women talk very seriously without batting an eye. You know, they're not like ribbing each other or saying, ha, 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 these young chicks. No, they're listening to them very seriously. And then I, I, that was when I realized there's something really important going on here. These are some Iranian Kurds that I met. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, Diyarbakir if there wasn't an action by the Turkish state during the conference. I was told not to photograph any of the, Turk, the, the, the police vehicles, so I didn't, but there's activity in the street. And it was also at that conference that I first saw the flag of the PKK for the first time. So, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, uh, how, how to really relate to these people, though, because the PKK is on the list of, the State Department's list of foreign terrorist organizations. And I thought, am I going to end up in jail, too? I didn't really know what to do. I'm not afraid of that anymore. They're not prosecuting anybody, anybody. But at the time, I was rather nervous about how to, somebody's finally interested in Murray ideas, and they're on the terrorism list, you know? <laughs> so, um, but then in, uh, in um, March of 2012, the Arab Spring reached Syria. The Syrian uprising began, and the, um, officers in the Syrian military began forming the, formed the free, Free Syrian army began fighting the Assad regime and keeping the Assad forces very busy in the southern part of the country. And the Assad regime did not want to have to fight the Kurds as well. So when the Kurds, in the July, on a hot summer night in July of 2012, in Kobani, a city that would later become famous for something else, said they came out into the street at 1 o'clock at night and they said, and they just told the soldiers to go home. They said, you either go to another part of Syria, turn in your weapons, and live here with us, but you can't be in the army anymore. And, and the, uh, the, the military that was stationed in Kobani looked around, and they knew that the Assad, Assad wasn't going to send any reinforcements. So they said, OK. So and then, then, it, then it was it, through, in the rest of the summer, um, the other cities of Rojava experienced the same, the same basically, the, 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 Syri the regime government decamped. And, Left them to the left the Kurdish areas to their own devices. Now the brilliant thing about about this was that you know a lot of times when when we have um, when there's a, a revolutionary moment or a kind of a, 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 a an upsurge uh, or a, 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 an oppressive event that causes an upsurge, upsurge, people think, okay, here we are in the streets. Now what do we do? <laughs> and there's a lot of confusion. The brilliant thing about this, about this Kurdish situation is that they had it all thought out. In fact, they had already started creating the alternative institutions. Because Erdogan had said, in, in, um, in, with, he had issued this Declaration of Democratic Confederalism that I told you about in 2005. And this was accepted as the goal of the Kurdish movement to create these alternative institutions. And then there are a lot of people gave a lot of, they took this very seriously. They gave a lot of thought to how to do this. What kind of institutions to create cities? City councils, neighborhood councils, assemblies, committees, a whole, they, 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 in, in both in North Kurdistan, up in Turkey, uh, under conditions of persecution, and also here in West Kurdistan, then too under conditions of persecution, under the Assad regime, they're illicitly creating these institutions that, that Erdogan had recommended. And he told them all, read Bookchin, so, which was, had, who had been translated into, into Turkish by that time, and and and, and uh, uh, whose books, whose Turkish books were available, books were available in Turkish, and they accepted in um, uh, 2011 the Kurdish movement declared declaration of auto uh, uh, the uh, democratic autonomy, which means impl which is the implementation of democratic confederalism, um, and so illicitly, <laughs> face risking torture, these Kurdish activists in northern Syria began began creating the institutions and the men the men were the most suspicious so the women so the women ended up doing a lot of the organizing 
because they were somehow regarded as less suspicious. The state didn't, didn't, didn't um, persecute them as much. So it was actually this, the women of the women's association called Dekitia Star, who, who created, who, who, who did a lot of the initial organizing, starting in 2003, 2004, 2005. Painstakingly created them. Then when the, when in March of 2011, when the Arab Spring came, some of them were already, they were already in place. Um, and, and some of the first institutions they created actually were um, uh, judicial committees. Because you see, the, 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 uh, the, the Assad state and the Turkish state had all, um, their, their judicial system was very top down. And so that if a Kurd was, was in a dispute with a Kurd, they had to face a, you know, a, a, a Syrian judge or a Turkish judge, and that, would, that, was, that could not have a good outcome. So, so one of the first counter institutions they created were peace, they called them peace and consensus committees, just to resolve disputes between Kurds so that they wouldn't have to go to the state. You know? and, 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 it, and it ballooned from there. Um, so that, um, yeah, so that by the time that, by that, that hot summer night in July 2012, where the people of Kobani came out and told the, uh, the soldiers to go away, to join them or go away, they were in, the, the institutions, institutions were in place. Uh, the, uh, I didn't. It was. It, I didn't find this out till later. But the first, the first uh, institutions they created in terms of this democratic self-government were neighborhood councils. So they created neighborhood councils and then district councils, which the district being the city and the surrounding area, and then the cantonal level. The neighborhood councils were so flooded with people because after all these years of oppression under the Assad regime, people were just so eager to participate politically that the meetings were just flooded. The neighborhood, in other words, turned out to be too big a unit. So in, in the Middle East, they have a, there's a smaller unit. They call it the residential street. It's just that it's basically just, just maybe 50 to 100 households. That became the smallest unit. That became the unit where the assembly was, where the citizens' assembly was, the very, like the, basically the equivalent of the town meeting. Um, and that, and, and that was created like second, secondarily to f accommodate this overflow. It turned out to be the, the foundation of the whole system now. So, so it's the commune at the level of the neighborhood street, the neighborhood, which sends, they send delegates to the neighborhood councils. The neighborhood councils send delegates to the district councils, and the district sends delegates cantonally. And then there's a system of committees as well, of parallel committees dealing, dealing with health, dealing with self-defense, dealing with um, all other kinds of kinds of issues, education, all other kinds of issues. Um, and they too exist at all different levels. Um, there are women's women's committees that we okay. In in the general, in the mixed in the mixed this, the mixed committees, um, women of course are encouraged to participate. In fact, they have to if the, every meeting has to have forty percent a forty percent quota of of a minimum forty percent women in order for it to have standing. Um, but there are also women's committees and women's councils that address only issues related to women, um, especially issues of sex sexual assault uh, and domestic violence. Um, we'll see some pictures of those later. Let's go to, before we, before we go any further, let's just go to Rojava. This is, this is the, one, the one way to get there. Um, this is going from I Iraq at a place called Samaka across the Tigris. This is the Tigris River. River. It's just a little red painted boat. Um, I think there's a couple of them now. But uh, it's very, it's very <coughs> informal. This is my delegation. And you get there. And you see it's basically a pre-capitalist country. Um, there's, it was, Hiroshima was deliberately kept undeveloped by the Assad regime. It was part of the, the colonizing approach toward the Kurds. Um, there were no factories. They, it was agricultural, but there were no, fertil, no fertilizer plants, for example. For, those were later. Those were in other, in other parts of Syria. Um, there were, they grew cotton, but there were no textile processing, no, no textile factories. No, th those were in other parts of Syria. There's oil, but there were no refineries in Rojava. Those were in other parts of Syria. So Syria was used by the regime to produce raw materials that could be processed in other parts of Syria. So, but, so it's, and it's still, you know, this is still only a couple of years after the revolution. It's very, still very pre-industrial. You're driving along and, yeah, this is what it looks like. 
coming into the cities. Um, it's not exactly that the <laughs> marriage of town and country <laughs> that uh, was envisioned by Bookshire and, and Mumford, but, but still, it's very small scale. It's very intimate. Um, the, the agriculture, you know, they don't have, pers they don't have the fertilizer <laughs> plants, so it's really basically organic food. The food was delicious when I was there. Um, and they have, they have jerry-rigged they have jerry-rigged refineries now, or ref um, an oil refinery, um, a couple of them actually, but um, they only produce what they can use in the society. They produce diesel, and it's used for generators to provide power in the cities, and also for the cars. I have to say that diesel is very, very polluting, and in that, in that <sighs> oppressive heat with a lot of dust and a lot of, uh, you know, the gases that are emitted by diesel, it's a little unhealthy. And um, insofar as the Kurdish movement is, is committed to ecology, I will, and they are ideologically, but I have to say right off the bat, they haven't had much of a chance to work on that um, because they've been preoccupied with other things like, you know, fighting, Tur fighting Turkey. But um, it's on their agenda. But for now, they're, they're having to cope with, uh, cope with um, the ecological that, that, yeah, having to cope with that, with that, those fumes. So this, but there are cities, they're, they're, they need, they, there's no public transportation, it's all um, cars. Um, but it's very low slung, very human scale. And you can see there are neighborhoods. And yeah, these are just, this is, these are just pictures of, to show you what the cities look like. Um, this is, um, Asaish. This is the the. Um, they don't have police in Rojava because police are associated with the state, and they and the people in Rojava are against the state. That's part of democratic confederalism, against the state. So instead of this, instead of police, they have self defense forces. They call them Asaish. Now you can really see they don't. They're against the state. They don't call themselves anarchists. Nobody uses that word there. And, but yet they're, in, they're passionately anti-state. And you can see why, because in Turkey, that was a state that was, that was you know, monolithically Turkish and monolithically oppressive to them. And a similar thing had actually a similar, it was very similar in, in Syria. Remember I told you that the, the Turkey defined everyone who lives in, the Turkish constitution defines everybody who lives there as a Turk. In Syria, it's the same thing. It's a Syrian Arab Republic. So everybody who lives in Syria was definitionally an Arab. And Kurds had been oppressed there as well. They had been, in many cases, even stripped of their citizenship. They couldn't own land. They had been, they had, they, they, whole hundreds of thousands of them couldn't get educations. They couldn't own property. They couldn't have jobs. It was nightmarish. Um, and so you can see why they would have a problem with the state. And the states in the Middle East were very arbitrarily created. You know, at the end of the First World War, um, the European pow victorious powers had come in, and come in and drawn lines. So, for example, they, some of the lines they drew, they just cut right through Kurdish cities. Oh, this part to the north is going to be Turkey. This part to the south is going to be Syria. Uh, um, absolutely arbitrarily, um, with no regard for, for, who, lived for who lived there. Um, so you can see why these, they would regard states as really artificial, artificial creations um, that provided absolutely no benefits for the people at all. It's not for the Kurdish people. It, they were only, it's only a source of oppression. So they're anti-state, passionately anti-state. And that's why they have the Asayish, self-defense forces. It's, these are the internal security forces instead of police. And they're, they're lovely people. And then they also have Asayish Jin, women Asayish, um, who are part of mixed forces, but they also handle domestic disputes. Um, we got used to just having these young women escorting us everywhere, carrying Kalashnikovs. And um, they did a very good job of protecting us. We've always, the two delegations I was in always felt entirely safe, even though ISIS was somewhere off beyond the horizon. This is um, a Asayish Academy. The Academy is a, is a PKK institution that derives from the mountains, the, the, the experience, experience in the Kandil Mountains. When they're training, in the, uh, during, the, during the 80s and the 90s, when they were training militarily in the mountains, they also trained ideologically in academies. And they learned, they studied um, Western 
social theory. They studied Mr. Ojalan's work. After a while, they began studying Bookchin's work. But they learned ideology is very important to them um, in ways that it isn't here. You know, in the United States, we tend to be very practical people. And that which is good is that which is effective and, and works well, where this is a you know, practical can-do people. Now, over there, they're very, they're, they take ideas and theory very, very seriously. So, so they would study it. And the uh, ideology is transmitted in these academies. Now, there's academies in Rojava, as there had once been in the Kandil Mountains, not just for ideological training per se, but for all aspects of society, for, for Asaish, for Asaish training, for, for economics, for cooperatives, for their women's academies, there's um, all whole health academies, there's all, 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 all aspects of life. But in every single academy, there's a component that teaches ideology, right? So at this Asaish Academy, they teach them how to do the normal things that, I don't want to use the word police because they don't use that word, but where internal security, that internal security would deal with. But the day I was there, you know, I just, it just occurred to me out of the blue to give them a greeting from Murray Bookchin. And, I, and as, I, as we were leaving, somebody told me that they had just been reading Bookchin that morning. So, um, so they study ideology, even in the police academies, in the women's academies, everywhere. And the, you probably know, have heard much more about the, the um, actual military forces that are fighting, fighting ISIS and fighting the Turks. That's, this is the YPG which was originally a mixed force between men and women, the People's Protection Units. Um, this is, the, this is it, the, the YPJ, the women's force didn't break off until 2013, um, but it was originally mixed. This is um, oh, at the YP, YPJ headquarters in Serakania. Serakania was in the western part of Jazeera Canton. Um, it was um, near, actually near a, near a battle zone. Um, this, is, this is a Chechen. This is a Chechen soldier, they have Chechens living in, they've been, been there since about the 1850s, living in northern Syria. Um, there's, um, in, ethnic inclusivity is very, very important for, for, um, for, all, for democratic confederalism. Um, and recognition that, that it's a recognition of the heterogeneity of the Middle East and that consociation is going to be absolutely essential if, if different peoples uh, and different religions are going to live together in peace. So it's um, uh, um, another really important pillar of their ideology. These are, I didn't, I wasn't on any battlefield, so I can't show you any shooting. But, um, and some of these photos actually were taken by p um, other people in my delegation. So this is not, this Apo is um, the affectionate name for Abdullah Ojalan. Um, and you can see they, they, still, they still mix gender. This is the YPJ. This is the, I find it very useful to know the flags, right? So the YPJ is the women's force um, that, as I said, broke off in 2013. And they became very well known during the battle for Kobani. As you, you probably saw pictures of the women carrying the Kalashnikovs fighting ISIS. And, and, and it's rumored that, um, yeah, that um, the jihadists don't want to be killed by a woman because that means they won't get their 72 virgins. After they after they die, and so so the women when they when they go on the attack they go like this so their high voices project and so that the so so dash ISIS dash knows that it's women coming and they will flee but it's not just but that makes it sound like that they're that they're only I, I don't want to overemphasize that too much because they're really they're very good fighters in their own right it's not simply that the the dash flee although that certainly it certainly YPG makes makes use of that it makes very canny use of that. But they're, they're very brave people. And as I say, these are, these are, this is the second generation, maybe even coming up in the third generation now, of women Kurdish fighters. It's nothing new anymore. You know, it's been going on with started, when it started in the Kandil Mountains, the PKK, with the PKK back in the 80s. So it's, this is, for young Kurdish women coming up now, it's normal to be fighters. These are, these are so, um, yeah, these people were some wounded, some wounded fighters who were, who were talking to us uh, one night. Um, yeah, they, if they weren't wounded, they would have been out in battle and we wouldn't have been talking to them. But um, this is Sarah Kania, the place where that headquarters was. 
This is the PYD headquarters. This is the flag of the PYD. The PYD is the is the um, the party that is uh, said to be affiliated with the PKK. Um, it is affiliated with the PKK. It shares the, it shares the Democratic Confederalist ideology. But whereas the PKK is on the U.S. terror uh, State Department's list of terrorist organizations, the PYD is not, and that's at least to for the U.S. government's um, participation with them that makes all the difference. So, and the PYD is is um, it's a party. It's it is. It's not, but it's not, this isn't a, a one, it's not a case of one party rule. There is an opposition um, in Rojava. There, it's called the ENKS. It's the op an opposition coalition. Um, this isn't a, it isn't a totalitarian state, right? It's uh, um, not at all. Although the PYD is very, very popular because so many of the Kurdish people, they are besieged people. They share these aspirations for freedom. Um, and the PYD represents it the best. So, they are, the PYD is very popular, but on the other hand, they're very, very careful to make sure that there's um, other parties, even if it means those other parties, uh, even other parties that are basically beholden to outside forces, like the KDP in Iraq, um, that, are, that are in some ways trying to manipulate and undermine the Rojava revolution. The, the, the politicos that we talked to said, we can deal with it, we can deal with it, we, but it's very important for there to be an opposition, and so they always, they always recognize that. Sarah Kaniya is where the first battle, the first battle against against Dash was. Soon after the, that 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 July 2012 that I told you about, when the revolution was was first first came about, um, almost immediately the Turk, Turkey Erdogan, the AKP government said, "This cannot stand," and so he began creating. Um, um, he couldn't invade himself, so he began creating surrogates like Al Nusra Front and different jihadist groups that he either created or subsidized so that they could attack, do his dirty work and attack Rojava, attack the Syrian Kurds for him. So in the first battle was at Sarakania. And yeah, <laughs> they, um, when I was there, they, you know, they haven't been able to rebuild because they're embargoed. They're under an economic and political embargo by Turkey and they don't have a lot of resources. So yeah. But they make up in spirit what they lack in material means. Do you want to take questions now? What? Do you want to take questions now? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, how, from what you saw, how much uh, support would you say Daesh and the various splinter groups were getting from Turkey versus Saudi Arabia, Yemen, U.S.? Or is it all basically indistinguishable? How much support? I, I would have to look at their documents, wouldn't I? I mean, their well, finances. I mean, I don't know. It, in it's, terms we of know the that opinion. we know that Daesh was create emerged out of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, right? With the with the um, uh, out of Al Qaeda in Iraq. We know that Saudi Arabia financed them, and also I think Qatar, and we also know that Turkey, sub real sub been supplying them, um, in all kinds of ways, logistically, medically, economically. How much? Each, I each of those, figure, yeah. Just like maybe opinion I don't really know. I, I don't really know, I, but I know that I, I really doubt that they would exist anymore without Tur without support from Turkey. Okay. So, but I can't. Yeah. As long as we're, is any any questions before I go on? I'm almost finished. <laughs> Another thing you notice when you're there is martyrs. There's um, commemorations of the dead everywhere. Um, they value their people, and they re and the people who are the families. Um, families of people who have been sacrificed get get uh, economic advantages. They get um, work in, um, uh, or they're pri they get a privileged position to work in the um, privileged access to the cooperatives, um, which I'll get to in a moment. That's become an issue, actually, by the part of the opposition because the opposition, this ENKS, those parties refuse to fight. Right? They don't. They don't. They don't supply soldiers. But then. If they don't supply soldiers to the YPG, they can't have martyrs. And if they can't have martyrs, they can't have access to the cooperatives. And so there was, in uh, at the end of 2014, when I was there, a new law was passed saying everyone has to contribute soldiers to the YPG, regardless, regardless of political party. It's not just PYD. So that so that, that economic resentment wouldn't emerge. Um, in here, as, as in Turkey, literature and language is very important. 
Um, but it's so much, it's gone so much beyond that now. That was the original grievance back in Turkey, right? Was the inability to, to use the Kur Kurdish language and to speak and, and, and to publish in Kurdish and to, and to enjoy Kurdish literature. But it's gone so much farther than that now. It's been an evolution, and this is, this is, I think, is the crucial thing to understand, that it's not just about cultural rights and cultural autonomy anymore. They want to democratize Turkey. They want to democratize Syria. They want to democratize the Middle East. You know, it's kind of, it reminds me a little bit of, back in the early 20th century, there was this group called the Bund in Central Europe. They were Jewish. They said, Jews cannot be, cannot be free as an ethnic, as a people, until the whole working class is free. So they subsume their own liberation as Jews to the, the goals of the working class. They were called Bundists. Now, I wouldn't say that the Kurds are subsuming their goals to the goal of democracy in the Middle East, but they're integral to it. There's a kind of a Bundist streak in them, that they understand that it's a broader process than just the liberation of their own ethnicity. It's about the, the, overthrowing, of, the overthrowing patriarchy in the Middle East which I, and I think the women of the Middle East are a sleeping giant, frankly. Um, it's, about, it's about creating democracy. It's about, you know, Ercan, Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, wants to remake the Turkish constitution into a, basically a presidential dictatorship. He wants to be able to issue edicts without any, any even approval from, from the Turkish parliament. The Kurds are counting that by saying, no, we need to democratize Turkey. It's not just about creating a, a, you know, Kurdish autonomy. It's about democratizing the country. And that's why the HDP was able to get um, so much support, I think, last June in that election, because it's not just about, it's not about Kurdish liberation alone. It's also about you know, all the, the disaffected forces in Turkey want to, are, are joining with them to, to work toward that goal. And, and when I was, in, I was in Istanbul just a couple of weeks ago, and, and social ecologists and anarchist comrades there, they said, the only, the only opposition is the Kurdish movement. It's the only opposition here. This is um, the Mesopotamian Academy. It would be called a university, but a university is associated with the state, and they don't want, they're not a state, right? So they call it an academy. Oh, and similarly, I forgot to mention this, they have um, um, we, what we would call a constitution, but they don't call it a constitution because a constitution is associated with state. Instead, they call it a social contract. So you can find this online, the social contract of of Rojma, which it, it basically includes like every human rights thing they could, um, plank they could find from different human rights groups around the world. It's quite remarkable what they're committed to. These are these teachers who are teaching Kurdish language. These are students, and this is the Malagao, this is the People's House. If you're familiar with the Spanish Revolution, you've heard of Casas del Pueblo. This is the Malagao, the People's House. This is where you can go to to um, uh, yeah, have your have issues settled, and this is the citizens' assembly. This is a, a commune meeting in a neighborhood of Kamishlo, or on a I should say a residential street, Kamishlo, and you can see that there are women participating. They're they're governing themselves. This is these are their town meetings. <laughs> and I have to say, this picture makes me think of that you know that that Norman Rockwell painting of the, of the guys <laughs> at the town meeting standing up. This, this, every time I see that, I laugh because it reminds me of him. <laughs> and you can see Arab headgear. So Arabs, are, Arabs meet with Kurds. Um, and this is the top end. This is the top end of, the, of that, those conf, the confederal, that confederal structure that I told you about. This is uh, yeah, Chizira Canton. This is the, um, one of the three cantons in Rojava. Um, this is the... He's been getting a lot of publicity lately. This is Akram Hesso, the prime minister. Um, why they have someone called the prime minister, I'm not sure. <laughs> but they are at war, and he's a talented man. So, and he considers himself to be accountable to the democratic, the democratic self-government. I'm not exactly sure how, but. <laughs> right, are you, I have questions too, right? <laughs> um, I have to say that both times I was there as a part of a, a, and delegations, we were spoken to by the political class, by the by politically savvy people. I don't, I didn't have, a, I don't know Kurdish, I can't talk to ordinary people. I couldn't go into a, a shop and ask somebody what they thought of democratic and federalism. I couldn't watch a, a decision being made, you know, going up from the different levels, um, or what, what, what would happen, you know, I couldn't observe with my own eyes the bottom up flow. I'm just going by what I was told 
Okay. So this is a, a, um, 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 another guy at the, at, on, the, on the legislative ends of things. And in his office, these are his, this is the jurisdiction. I guess these are, these are the different communes and, and uh, uh, neighborhoods of Jazeera Canton. So we got it all divided up there. He said there's um, about 4,000 communes, and they all meet. This is where the, the top end of the Confederal Council meets. There was no meeting that day. I wish I could show you people, but I can't. Um, uh, yes, so, and every, every position <laughs> has to be, it's dual. It's a, called the principle of dual leadership, and one has to be a man and one has to be a woman. So there, there's a, a Chizira Canton has, has two heads, and one is this Hadia Youssef, who's a very, very, she's an old, I think she's an old PKK fighter. Um, this is the uh, Women's Academy. It's interesting, these are the three uh, PKK women who were killed in Paris in 2013. And some of you will recognize Rosa Luxemburg there, who they admire very much. This is um, a women's meeting out in the open, talking about their issues of domestic abuse at home. This would have been unheard of, unheard of in Syria just a few years ago, unheard of in the Middle East in most parts of the Middle East today. But here they are, airing their problems. They're not, they're, 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 they're out, in the, out, of the, out of the private sphere and out in, into the public realm. It's amazing. And I love this because young women coming up, you, you, there's no turning back because the young women coming up are getting a taste of this freedom. Yeah, this is the Minister for Women's Affairs. Just, just some examples of women's leaders. This is the Deputy Foreign Minister who Took both my delegations around. She's a very talented woman. Culture minister. Some other prominent women we met. And minorities. Remember I told you that uh, consociation is very important. These are, these are members of the Assyrian community um, that we met with. We said, what are your problems with the democratic self-administration? They said, we don't have any problems with the democratic self-administration. We have problems with Daesh. And they, you know, they, these women, uh, especially, you know, they, they share similar kinds of problems to the, to the Kurdish women, you know, those, those pro the problem of honor killings, the problem of early marriage, all of they, they're subjected to the same patriarchy. That's why I think the women of the Middle East are a sleeping giant because, and that's one reason I think this, this, this um, new society that's being built there is working because the women are the glue because they, they're, 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 they're bonding with each other um, uh, um, in solidarity. This is the, the co-governor of um, Hadia Youssef's co-governor. He's a sheikh. I can't remember his name. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. And oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm getting tired, and you probably are too. But um, yeah, and I haven't even started talking about the economy yet. Um, of course, most of the mon most of the money that is uh, most of the the the, 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 the the income is from selling oil to the people, but at a very low price. Right for their to running the generators and running the, running the, um, their cars. No, nobody pays any taxes. Food is supplied. Um, remember, I told you that there were no that there that wheat was grown, but there was no, no milling. Well, they formed a cooperative flour mill now. All the new enterprises that are created are cooperatives. There is still private property there, but the policy of the of the system is to is for the new enterprises to be cooperative. It's part of what they call the social economy, the social economy, which I think is such a beautiful word, um, in the recognition that we're all that they're all dependent on each other. Um, they don't have a they don't valorize individual enterprise the way we do here. They don't have a myth of the free market the way we do here. They they realize they're all we're all in this together. So they create cooperatives, it's daily bread ration. Hi. Can I ask a question about that? I'm sorry. Um, what type of a cooperative is it? Is it, is it owned by um, the, the workers or is it owned by um how is it like put together, basically? Yeah, everybody, everybody who works on it owns a share, owns a share. And since it's mostly an agricultural society still, these are mostly agricultural um, cooperatives that we're talking about, although there are, there are other kinds as well. Um, I actually just got a document breaking down um, um, po cooperative policies. If you want to write to me, I can, I'd be happy to share it with you. It was issued by... Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I haven't had a chance to study it entirely myself yet, but it, if you have a special interest in cooperatives, I might, I might be interested to you. Dairy cooperative. This is a greenhouse. 
cooperative. This is um, the, uh, a women's cooperative growing peppers. These, these, these women have never worked outside the home before. They were always confined to the, pub, to the private sphere. Now they have their own income, so they're not dependent on, their, on the men anymore, on their husbands or fathers. And this is a huge, huge transformation in their lives. They, this is a sewing cooperative. Um, they're, they're making um, uh, uniforms for the YPG and the YPJ. You notice it's both men and women working together. Again, the women have an income for the first time. Um, I don't know how this art and art and culture is also a huge, <laughs> one of their biggest, biggest um, forces of production there is art and culture. We met all kinds of painters and dancers and singers. They're reviving Kurdish, Kurdish music, Kurdish literature, music, Kurdish, Kurdish um, dance. Um, it's just hugely important. They, these people, they dance all the time. It's amazing. It just, I mean, like every day there's something to dance about. I just, I'm just, they just fall into it. And it's, um, you know, it's kind of this communal dancing they do. It's not like, it's nothing fancy. It's just like, they have some certain like very simple steps that anybody, even a big klutz like me, you know, can just do it so that, so that it's very easy for people to just fall in and participate and, and, and um, nobody feels like, oh, they're, you know, this isn't for me, I can't dance. You know, everybody, everybody does it. It's part of their, part of their communitarian way of life. It's like living in a musical. <laughs> See, there's this doing this, yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to stop there, but let me know if you have any more questions. Um, but I, they, people, people who were organizing it knew me and knew, my, knew of my work because I had done this translating and, because, and, they, knew of, and they knew I had been um, attending Kurdish conferences and writing about the Bookchin and Erjelan connection. So they knew that, uh, yeah, that, that I was interested. And, and then, um, so with the academic delegation, when I, I, I heard about it and I asked to go and they said, of course you can come. So, and they wanted, they wanted people to write. You know, they want people to come and see the revolution so that they can, they can go home and write. And I had a reputation for writing. So, uh, yeah, so, I, so that, was, that was the first one. And we were there for 10 days the first time. And the second time I went was in October of 2015. And that was for um, something called the New World Summit. It was a, um, kind of a, a project organized by some Dutch people called the New World Academy. They create um, parliaments for stateless people. And they've done it, and they, they create them in different parts of the world. It's partly a political gathering and partly an architectural architecture project, because they literally build these structures, um, temporary parliaments, um, where stateless peoples can meet. And they decided to have one in Rojava, which was very bold, since given the, all the economic embargo and lack of materials and so on, but they managed to pull it off last October, and they invited some of us to, to, and they wanted me to speak there, and there were other international speakers there. So we, we traveled around for like five days beforehand, um, visiting many of the th things I'd already seen before the previous time, um, and then and then was this parliament, and there was this parliament. So, yeah. That's how I happened to go. Yes? Thank you. I mean, the, the question that comes to mind is, how does this form of democratic autonomy that you have there coexist with, say, older structures, older social structures, either organized through religion, so religious associations, uh, and or through kind of tribal or kinship groups. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how does this new form of social organization, social political organization, is it in tension with, or does it kind of build upon already existing forms of like non-state association? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, that's, you're, you're right to point that out, because this is, it's, it ha does not pervade the whole society yet. There still is a lot of tribalism. That sh that sheikh that I showed you, for example, he's he's um, part of a very very large tribe in the area, and he actually has a lot of an independent power, you know, of that of this structure. And so, yes, I think there is there is tension to, for for integrating it. Again, I don't I can't I can't give you much detail because, as I said, I heard from 
official people, you know. So I don't, I don't really know, but I, you can see that there would, that there would be, it's, and I'm sure there's, there's resistance to, um, resistance to the gender equality. I'm sure that happens. Um, but, but by comparison, you know, by comparison with with Dash, which is, and, and with Turkey, which is, which is always offered up, you know, there are people who, um, there are Arab villages that are that delight to be, to be liberated. From Dash by the YPG and the YPJ, they're very happy to be liberated, and they, you know, like 1,500 Arab villages have been liberated now. So, um, and I think that that's um, um, uh, once they see the model in action, and once they see that co that, that cooperation is possible, and that the Kurds are not about taking revenge. That's very very important. When I went to the YP YPG headquarters, and when I went to the Asayish headquarters, and other places as well, and they were briefing us on what goes on there, one of the first things they said was, we teach them, do not take revenge against the Arabs. Which, you can see it would have been so tempting for human beings, having been oppressed by Arabs for generations, you know, to try to take it out. No, no revenge. And they're modeling that. And it doesn't mean that there aren't mistakes, and there aren't rogues, and there aren't, there haven't, it hasn't been perfect. But that's, that's the program. And they're slowly, slowly trying to build trust that way for this new alternative. Okay. Yes. Uh, do 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 um, who 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 and what I am. Um, I focus a lot on, uh, for back, uh, lack of a better term, radical queer politics. So um, I was just wondering throughout this, because of the gender equality, um, uh, how 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 has that affected um, the the uh, wide, widespread homophobia and transphobia that I've read? somewhat about in that occurring in the Middle East as it occurs most places. No, um, sexuality itself is not much on the agenda in the places amongst the political class. It's, it, it's um, in the, the YP, the, the, the PKK, as, as I understand it, is basically celibate. You are, you're married to the movement, right? Your, your lover is the movement. Um, and this is because when they, they were, when they were in um, decades ago, when they were re first recruiting women, the families wouldn't let women join the PKK because, not because they might, you know, get pregnant by way of lover or something like that, but because it would bring dishonor on the family. You know, it's that honor concept again. It would bring dishonor on the family if they, one of the girls went wayward. It was, it's, you know, honor is just this crazy thing there. So, so the PKK had to promise no sexuality. So it's, it's basically celibate, and if, if two people happen to fall in love, they're separated. So um, that's something that, that uh, makes this very unusual and maybe not, and could be hard to apply this to, <laughs> to other parts of the world. But this is, I think it's, it's also related to this very specific situation of the Kurds, because they're, they're so, they're so uh, they have to mobilize themselves to fight. They're, it's re they're really in an existential fight for themselves as Kurds, so they put sexuality second. However, I was at a, when I was in Hamburg, there were these, um, I was sitting with Mehmet Aksoy, who publishes Kurdish Question um, in, in London, and he was telling me that these performers there, that one of the performers up there was a transsexual, and he was in the PKK, and it was just regarded as nothing. It was just completely accepted. Um, but on the other hand, sexuality is very repressed. So. I, I don't know how to answer you any more than that. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Can you say a little bit about the, the Kurdish language relation to Turkish, to Arabic, to Persian? Yeah, it's an Indo European language, unlike Arabic and unlike Turkish. So it's, yeah. And there are different dialects. There's a Kermanji dialect that's spoken in Syria, there's a Sorani dialect that's spoken in, in uh, Iran. There's several dialects. I find it very, very difficult. But you can hear, but there are cognates, like Asaish Jin, Jin, J-I-N. That J-I-N means woman, and it's related to G-Y-N, right, in English. So there are some cognates, but I really like that one. I wish there were more obvious ones like that. <laughs> but there aren't enough <laughs> to make it easy for me to learn Kurdish. I'm, I have a lot of, I've, I've tried, it's hard to learn. And the Kurds are all Sunnis? They're Sunnis, yes, but they don't do religious, the politics of religion. They keep it to themselves. And actually they are, especially in Turkey, they're moving away from Sunni and they're, they, um, 
um, um, uh, more and more moving towards Zoroastrianism, which they, which is the religion of the Yazidis. The Yazidis are Kurdish people, and they're regarded as the most ancient of Kurdish peoples, and they 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 adhere to Zoro, uh, basically a variation of Zoroastrianism. And the Kurds, there are certain Kurds are getting very are so alienated by um, the the politics of Islamization going on in Turkey now that they're just disgusted with Islam as such, and they're shifting over to Zoroastrianism. But but uh, but again, they don't they don't wear their it's very rare for the Middle East they don't wear their religion on their sleeve. They're 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 they're, they're the whole ambiance is is secular. Even though of course there are there are mosques in in Rojava, and yeah. So but. Um, it's 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 on the back burner. So, are you aware of any organizing state side to um, perform solidarity with the Kurds? Like, are there any groups that are organizing to help Rojava, or are there any rallies coming up? I know there's a big rally in London um, this Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, to stop Turkey's war on the Kurds. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of anything? Asking about um, Ro Rojava solidarity groups in the U.S. Yes, yes, there are. Oh, there's one in New York. Um, there's Cascadia. There's uh, the one probably. Oh, I don't know if you all are still working on it. Um, a little bit, yeah. There's some organizing going on here, and then uh, up in Montreal, there's some comrades up there that are still pretty active. They have a very lively group up in Montreal. That would be probably the close, the closest place. They're planning. They're planning a big action for later this spring. Um, that I'm going to participate in, but they, don't ha they haven't set the date yet. Probably sometime in April. Awesome. But um, but they have they've made um, yeah they've, there's good connections between uh, Anglophone <laughs> Montrealers and Kurdish Kurdish the local Kurdish community, and they're tr they're working on yeah building those bonds up. So, yeah. Is there uh, any connection between the um, the Kurds of Rojava and the Gulenist movement in Turkey and outside of Turkey? What about it? What about the Gulenists? Um, is there a connection between the Kurds and um, no. Rojava? No, the Gulenists were actually working very closely with the AKP. They were is Islamic. Um, group. They were they were allied with the, the AKP until the AKP decided to persecute them and. One, yeah, <laughs> um, but it's it's a it's a different it's uh, doesn't have doesn't relate to the Kurdish issue. Yeah, it's a separate per, a separate persecution by the AKP. Keith, um, I I was just wondering if there's talk of like I just wonder if there's a situation of crisis. It's the civil war, but is there talk of um, the role of private property and folks who are large property owners and the disproportionate power? they hold in the economy and how that, like is there moves to sort of decentralize the economy beyond building the cooperatives, but to take private property and move it towards communal property? As far as I know, that's not on the agenda now. They're, right. very, they're very aware of um, Western social theory. They're very, you know, they're, they used mm -hmm. to be Marxists. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they do, they, they get it. They get the problems yeah, yeah. with that. It's not on the agenda, it's, it's, at least when I was there, I didn't see any signs that it was on the agenda uh -huh. at the moment, but as you know, they're busy fighting the war. So oh, yeah. you know, that's that sort of su has to supersede everything, uh -huh. and it also makes it hard to, you know, the, the, the ha you don't hear too much about people going to Rojava lately. There haven't been doesn't seem there don't seem to be as many delegations anymore. I think mm -hmm. it's it's um, the focus has shifted to Turkey now, mm -hmm. to the persecution and to the war in Turkey, and basically, Rojava seems to be so consumed with fighting, fighting Dash. Um, I, I I every now and then I, I you know I hear from someone who's come and it, they're basically repeating what I already know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to get news. It's hard mm -hmm. to get news from there. Do you think there are any lessons uh, that revolutionaries and radicals outside of the area can uh, learn from? Are there, you know, it seems like, just at, at first glance, there's this tendency where the state has sort of pulled up stakes and left for one reason or another that these kinds of movements and moments can flourish from here to Zapatistas to, I mean, a lot of, a lot of history shows that tendency. Um, but for people who are organizing here, you know, in the most powerful state in the world, do you, do you feel like there's any, any lessons that we can learn from that, anything that we can, we can take inspiration from and apply to our work here in the States? I think, I think one of the most brilliant, brilliant lessons for me is 
the way they had those institutions in place when the revolutionary moment came, when the crisis came. Mm -hmm. they, had, they, had, or they had been working on them and building them and under conditions where they could be arrested and thrown into jail and tortured at any time. You know, we could, we don't have that equivalent here in our free society, but um, it's, it's more, uh, but, um, and, yet, and, and yet, and yet they did it. And so that when the, when the brass ring came around, they were ready to grab it. And I think that, that, I think that that's um, uh, a very important lesson. I think that you don't, you don't wait for the revolutionary crisis because when the crisis comes, it's too late. That the organizing needs to happen now when things are quiet and boring, you know? And, and, and I think it's part of, part of what you know, Sanders is pointing to, that you need a political revolution you know, in between. He's speaking to that a little bit, you know, when he says, it's not enough to elect me, you have, you have to have a movement. I mean, he, and I'm talking, and he's talking about a, you know, a presidential campaign, but, but there, you, there's a sort of a parallel to that. I think at the grassroots level is that we just need to, that the, the or, that it's a, it's important to create alternative institutions and alternative power structures, even even so th so that we will will be ready when the crisis comes. So. Anyone else? Sorry, it's about what the future holds for this struggle. The future of just of the struggle for West Kurdistan um, and like war in Turkey and like, what they're facing and what that the future could possibly look like. Oh, um, depends. A lot of it depends on what Turkey does. I mean, if they're going to really, I mean, they're shelling across the border now. Um, will they? Will they dare to actually invade? Um, if they do, what will the Russian response be? The U.S. is does, is it seems to be very laid back these days. Um, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, Obama seems to be just waiting out his term in terms of helping. Still, he's assisting the YPG and YPJ, but nowhere near on the level that the Russians are. And so it's leading the YPG and the YPJ to ally with the, with the Russians more. They've opened an office in Moscow now and, and how that dynamic will play out. You know, I think it, on the, I think it, um, uh, the, 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 the Turks shot down that Russian fighter jet last November, and I think the Russians are just itching to get back at them. But what it means is that Turkey can't mount an actual ground invasion because the Russians will come right at them. So in a way, for me, I'm actually glad that fighter jet was shot down because it sort of created a stalemate between Turkey and Russia at this point that, that works to the protection of the YPG and YPJ. So, um, but I think it's, I think that, um, that Erdogan in Turkey is really, um, uh, just got losing control. I mean, I think yeah. he's just he's getting a little bonkers. So that he's, you know, the the Sally Muslim, one of the co the co leaders of the of the PYD, uses the word Kurdophobia for um, Erdogan, and I find that a very useful term. It really defines the thing that he is most that he is most against. Whether it's the Kurds in southeastern Turkey or whether it's the Kurds in Syria, They're all, it's all of a piece to him. These are, the, these are the enemies that he defines as terrorists. So tens of thousands of people marking, marching in Diyarbakir today, those are all terrorists for him. You know? so, and he's, he's just um, insanely, insanely, um, he, uh, he seems, you know, someone, uh, Davatolia, the prime minister, referred to the, the Kur these Kurdish activists as Armenian gangs, which conjures up imagery of, of the Armenian genocide. So some of us were speculating when we were in Istanbul last time that, that um, you know, if Turkey could end up fomenting, a, a invading, a, invading Syria, and there could, we could end up with a general war there, behind the fog of war, and behind the fog of war, he could carry out a, a genocide of the Kurds the way the uh, Armenian genocide was carried out in the fog of World War I. Right when, when everybody, nobody was paying attention to what was happening inside Turkey, and suddenly this whole ethnic group is destroyed, um, we're speculating that, that that might happen. So that's that's the huge fear. That's why I say these people marching, the people in in um, North Kurdistan marching now, it's a, they're they're under an existential threat. There's they're really there's a really there's a, someone told me, there we all think World War Three is coming. So. Oh, do you, can you recommend? Is there anything published that one might uh, grab to read up on this? Uh, a lot of stuff online. Yeah. Um, David Phillips has written a book about the Kurdish 
called the Kurdish Spring, which is he's, he's very interesting. I don't really recommend Michael Gunther so much, but um, David Phillips. David Phillips, the Kurdish Spring. Yeah, okay. and um, um, Joost Jungerman, um, J O O S T J O N G E R D E N. The Dutch academic who's written about the PKK and the ideological transformation, and he's, he's been to Rojava a couple times also. Um, he writes very interestingly about it. And um, yeah, there's a lot of material online, but yeah. books, you know, not so much. AK yeah. Press just published a book called uh, Small Key Opens Many Doors. Okay. And we have an excerpt from it, um, not a copy. That's true. Yes, that's, that. that's a good collection. Also, Stateless Democracy by um, New World Academy. Who put the people who put on the New World Summit? They could also. You know, it's, it's also a, a comparable small collection. Anyone else? Does the U.S. have any way to put leverage on Erdogan? Does the U.S. have any way? Have any way of applying pressure on Erdogan? Yep, they don't. I mean, our NATO ally. Right. I mean. I think I think they're I think um, yeah President Obama and Vice President Biden are both both have had plenty of opportunities to talk to Erdogan and and um, try to get him to cool his jets but they, but he, he, they they every time they, 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 there's a news of a phone call or a meeting they come away saying those PKK people are terrible and Erdogan has a right to do what he wants with them in, within his borders they'll stand by the the YPG. You know, they're allies against Daesh, but they're just abysmal, abysmal uh, um, in, in, in enabling Erdogan to persecute the Kurds. It's, it's, it, it makes me angry every day. Um, I have a question. You talked about um, specifically um, Russia and um, the United States support of Rojava, and um, that being part of, like, some of the reason why they have they haven't been invaded. Um, my question would be, how um, essential is that support from other countries um, for the continuation of them being able to like sustain themselves and continue to fight? And what is the implication on that for um, attempts to form other systems like that and possibly make something like this more of a, a larger scale endeavor? Mm -hmm. Well, the Kurds will be the first to tell you that they could not have succeeded without, you know, they wouldn't have succeeded in Kobani without the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes. You know, I mean, there and that's 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 continuing now. Um, um, so, has that in, has that affected the po the politics um, of of the place? I don't know. <laughs> um, um, can it certainly? But 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 uh, Rojava is still under embargo. It still doesn't you know cut off, it's cut off economically from what they call capitalist modernity. Cut off from the capitalist system, so no investment can come in. Um, if they, they would like, when I was there, the economic people who briefed us said we would very much like an investment to come in because we can't go on like this. You know we need it, but if it's going to come in, it has to adhere to our principles of the social economy which means it has to be organized around cooperatives. So, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine a you know, capitalist investment coming in and being content with a cooperative, but um, last I heard that issue had not even been challenged yet because, they, because nobody was investing. Um, uh, what, I, what, we worry, what I worry about is that, you know, in, in traditionally the Kurds have a, cha have a history of being useful to various powers, both the West and Russia, and then once their usefulness is is passed, then they're just they're just um, uh, yeah, all, that's for, it's all forgotten. So and they're betrayed. They're perpetually betrayed. So part of them expects it, but they they also have a strong principle of hope, and they they are very they they, they yeah. Can I ask a follow-up to that? What? Can I ask a follow-up to that? Of course. Um, so I asked um, earlier about cooperatives specifically because um, from my experience with um, a lot of times um, specifically like consumer owned or like 
cooperatives or member-owned cooperatives uh, can emulate um, the, the capitalist system a little bit, especially a lot of the exploitative um, means of it. So when I was trying to, I was kind of like asking about it because I was wondering if there was like, is it like cooperatives in general or is it like a strict type of cooperative? Because I feel like a lot of times, just like say, people say cooperatives as if it's some sort of like magic bullet. Right, I, I hear you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, they're, they're, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, sharing egalitarian structure. But it could, they could just function also like capitalist enterprises in, ter in relation to the rest of the economy. So that's that's a real danger. You're right. Um, these are worker cooperatives, not co consumer cooperatives, mm -hmm. um, and they are they are accountable to the democratic self self administration, to the economic committees, mm -hmm. which I regard as promising because that means they're embedded in the political structure, and it's the political structure that you know the, that that provides the guidance, provides the context in which the cooperatives exist and creates the rules for them. So they're not just out or free running around, freely running around in the capitalist marketplace and getting compromised in those ways. They're embedded in, in the democratic self-administration and are accountable to, and thereby are accountable to the people. So that's how, that's how it works on paper. How long that will last, how, how that plays out in detail, I don't know, but that's, that's the game plan. Do you want to take any more questions, or should we wrap up? What would you like to do? I think that could take one more question. Someone has one. What happened to the moment of peaceful relations between Kurds and Turks? That seemed like it. There were, there were the peace talks <coughs> between the 2013 and 2015. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, it was. It was. You know, the, the, the PKK made a ceasefire, and nobody was killed during those. Two and a half years. Yeah. It was really wonderful, um, but then, but then the um, the election happened, and the HDP did far better than Erdogan could stand, and so he, he went on. That's when he went on to the war footing after that, that that election. And now, um, you know, now the, the peace talks are on hold, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure how serious the Turks were in any case. Um, if you read some of the transcripts and the way we just read the flow of the way the back and forth and the different proposals, you know, the, the PKK would make a concession. They would say, okay, we're going to withdraw into, into Iraq. We're going to lay down our arms. And then it was time for the Turkish state to do something, you know, and just to, to dismantle one of their, their garrison stations, and they didn't do it. So, so it, you know, reading the transcripts and reading the course of that peace negotiation makes me wonder how much the Turkish state really planned to, what, what was just using it as a chance to uh, rebuild, build up, build up uh, uh, their own forces and to get the PK, try to get the PKK to, to stop. And it seems, it seems, all seems rather cynical to me in retrospect. But, uh, but yet, but yet, you're right. It is the only hope. I mean, the PKK could never defeat the Turkish state. The Turkish state is the fourth largest, largest army in the world. I think. And the Turkish state is never going to be able to quell the Kurdish movement. It's it's because you know, and I guess tens of thousands of people are now identified as terrorists. You know, the, there's a the, the, there's a continuum between the PKK and just the Kurdish people now, and they're 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 so tied in together. You can't extinguish that 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 desire for freedom and the desire for democracy that is shared not just by Kurds but by other people in Turkey as well. So it's a, it's a it's a stalemate. They have to they have to have peace negotiations. Thank you. Your talk has been very interesting. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.